True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. On the morning of January 21st, 1998, 12-year-old Stephanie Ann Crow was found dead on her bedroom floor. She'd been brutally stabbed to death as her family slept soundly in their bedrooms down the hall. Stephanie's parents desperately called 911 for help. After police officers arrived at the scene, a cursory search of the Crow home found no signs of forced entry. There was an unlocked sliding glass door in the parents' room, but it was covered by aluminum vertical blinds. They would have made too much noise for someone to enter undetected, officers decided. Join us at the quiet end for Confessions of Youth, the story of the murder of Stephanie Crow and the false confessions that followed. On the morning when Stephanie's body was found, detectives came to an early conclusion that her murder was an inside job, and from that day forward they worked to make the evidence fit their theory instead of letting the evidence develop their theory. This method of investigation, wrong for many good reasons, sent the Crow family, and two other families as well, into a prolonged state of victimhood. So let's have a beer and talk about it. Yeah, this is a tough case. It bothers me. It's one of those frustrating ones, yeah. Yes. Yep. So we're going to drink some Hoptimum. It's an IPA, Imperial IPA, from Sierra Nevada Brewing Company. And it's brewed with fresh hops. So it's a once a year, early to late fall beer when the hops are picked. This is a good one. It's 11% alcohol by volume. So we're just going to share one. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's a nice hazy brass color, kind of a medium size off white head. Nice amount of lacing on the glass. Uh, the aromas seem to be pretty well divided between hops and malt. There is pine and citrus and lots of sweet malt. Mm. And taste followed form. Resinous piney hops, some grapefruit, a lot of caramel. So it's a pretty nice beer. It's not that hoppy, so you'll probably like it more. Well balanced and uh, don't even notice the alcohol, which is kind of dangerous. <laughs> it can be, yes. Yes, it can. Well, let's open it up. You ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's head on down to the quiet end, and I just want to say that beer may be necessary while talking about this case, because it really is crazy making. I was so frustrated and upset, even though I knew where the story was going. It's really a story of a family's tragic sudden loss of a 12-year-old girl, which you think would be bad enough, but that's followed by false confessions that threaten to ruin three other young lives. Now, before we get started, I'd also like to give my thanks to attorney Donald E. McGinnis for his book on this case titled She's So Cold. He really did a great job telling the story, and he was actually the defense attorney for one of the suspects. So that was very, very helpful in putting together this show. Let's get started, Dick. Okay. So Judith Kennedy was awakened on January 21st, 1998 by a buzzing noise and she soon realized it was her granddaughter's alarm clock, and it was time for Stephanie and her two sibs to get up and get ready for school. Now, Judith lay in bed quietly for a few seconds, waiting for Stephanie to turn off her alarm, but she soon gave up on that and got out of bed, throwing on her robe. She could see her other granddaughter, 10-year-old Shannon, still asleep in the bed next to her. Judith was staying in Shannon's room while visiting the family. Yeah, Judith didn't see or hear any signs of movement in the home of her daughter and son-in-law. And still sleepy, she walked down the hallway. She was barely able to see because it was early and not light outside yet. Twelve-year-old Stephanie's bedroom doorway was inset in a shallow little alcove, so there was even less light in there. So Judith felt for Stephanie's partly open door, found the knob, and then pushed it open with her hand. 
Softly calling out Stephanie's name, she stepped into the room. But she hit something with her foot, something that felt large and soft. She fumbled for the light switch and gasped when she saw her granddaughter, Stephanie, laying on the floor. And at first she thought she was covered in mud, but she knew at the same time that that made no sense. Stephanie did not look right at all, and Judith began to scream. Oh my God, she cried. Cheryl, Stephen, come quick. It's Stephanie. She's covered in mud. Hurry, she's covered in mud. So over and over, Judith shouted the same thing, and she woke the other family members. All except for Stephanie, of course, who was motionless on her floor. Steve Crow jumped out of bed and ran down the hall. When he reached Stephanie's doorway, he fell to his knees. Still half asleep, he stared at his daughter in shock. He couldn't make any sense of what he was seeing. His daughter was lying on her back in a pool of brown liquid, and worse yet, her eyes were blank, glassy, and wide open. A mystery novel she'd been reading, titled The Twisted Window, was lying beneath her right foot. So shaking, Steve bent over her body and cradled her head in his hands. She was stiff and cold, and he realized it wasn't mud that covered her body. It was blood. So he looked over her body in shock, trying to figure out what had happened, but she was fully covered in her own blood. He began to scream out no repeatedly, and he was crying full on when his wife and Stephanie's mother, Cheryl, made her way to the horrible scene. Over Steve's shoulder, she saw her daughter. Then Cheryl collapsed to the floor, and she lifted Stephanie's lifeless body into her arms. Cradling her daughter, she was shaking uncontrollably, talking to her, saying, Stephanie, it's Mommy, please talk to me. And she stroked her face. She said, Mommy will make it all better, rocking her back and forth, just wishing for it not to be true. So Cheryl's pain and crying were hard for the rest of the family to hear. God, please let me get her warm again, she sobbed. Then she looked up at her mother, Judith, and said, Oh, Mom, she's so cold. Cheryl pulled Stephanie more closely against her, holding her tightly to her chest as she continued to talk to her and sob. Steve called 911 crying that his daughter was dead and there was blood all over the place. So when the paramedics got to the house, Cheryl was still holding her daughter's cold body. Her face was distorted with pain and she refused to let go of Stephanie. And the paramedics gently coaxed her away until she finally released her. But they may as well have let her hold her child because there was nothing to be done to save her. She had already been dead for more than six hours. So this was the beginning of the most awful day for the Crow family. And this tragedy was set off a nightmarish and protracted ordeal with law enforcement. It was the beginning of what would be known as the Crow murder case. So Ralph Clater a veteran police detective in Escondido, California, rarely began his day rushing to the scene of a homicide. Now, as a father himself, Clater was very disturbed when he got the call telling him to hurry to the crow house where a child was dead. He would lead the investigation and many of the interrogations of suspects, and this would be his last homicide investigation. The crow home was located in one of the more isolated parts of town, a small four-bedroom, single-level ranch. It was on a hillside, and it wrapped around a pool overlooking an 18-acre avocado grove. But the grove had been mostly destroyed by wildfires years earlier. Detective Clater drove up the hillside, though through the eerily quiet neighborhood looking for the crow's address. By the time he arrived, the property was surrounded by squad cars as well as crime scene vehicles. Emergency lights flashed as two uniformed cops walked up to the car. They led him inside the house as they explained to him what they knew so far. Stephanie lay lifeless on the floor, soaked in her own blood. It seemed even more obscene in the early morning light of her bedroom. The weapon used was obviously a knife, but there were no knives found at the scene, and there were no signs of a break-in. In the notebook of the first officer on scene, it read, one, body was discovered by victim's grandmother, a temporary guest. Two, victim's mother, Cheryl, and victim's brother, 14-year-old Michael, reported hearing a vague thumping noise in the night, but neither had investigated. Three, Cheryl Crow heard her bedroom door open once or twice in the night, 
and assumed it was the family cat. Right. So other officers were checking the house and the grounds, looking for clues. Metal detectors helped them find a buried kitchen knife, but that was eliminated as the murder weapon. Stephanie had been stabbed multiple times in her head, neck, and shoulders, and the wounds were deep. They were too deep to have been inflicted by an average kitchen knife. Clater joined in the search, and he noticed that there were cobwebs and thick dust that eliminated the front door of the house as an entry point. Similar evidence excluded the windows on the side of the house, even though one window screen was bent back in Stephanie's room. But this was apparently old damage. The screen was bent but appeared undisturbed. It had been pulled out in the bottom left corner and the window had been left unlocked so a phone line could be run into her room because Stephanie loved to talk on the phone. Something girls did in those days a lot before texting. So days into their investigation, police found the words kill, kill penciled in small letters on her bedroom windowsill. Police would try and say that this was Michael's handwriting, her brother. Still, writing kill, kill on someone's windowsill wouldn't make that person a murderer. And this was actually roughly printed, so I don't see how it could be identified as anyone's handwriting, really. To get to the parents' bedroom from outside, someone would have to have opened a sliding screen door, which police did find partly open, then opened the sliding glass door, which was found closed and then they'd have to get past the vertical blinds, which were also found closed. Parents Steve and Cheryl Crow, sleeping just feet away, said they heard nothing, though. But an officer did tell Clater that the sliding doors off the master bedroom were open a few inches. These doors were poorly maintained and made a loud noise as he moved them. So did the vertical blinds that were inside. Since this doorway was no more than a foot from the head of Steve and Cheryl's bed, Clater quickly decided that entry there would have made enough noise to wake them up for sure. So the evidence thus far led Detective Clater to conclude that the crime had to have been committed by someone already inside the house. FBI training manuals do make this point. The first suspect in the killing of a young girl is always the father or stepfather, then the mother, then anyone else living in the house. The last option, the least likely, is a stranger. So Clater asked if Stephanie had been sexually assaulted, and the forensic specialist told him that it, that was unlikely. But they wouldn't know for sure until they got the medical examiner's report. Yeah, the family members were really scrutinized by the detective. He ordered that all of them be kept in the living room out of the way of the investigators, and they were told not to talk among themselves. Also, an officer was assigned to watch over them and ensure that they weren't talking. Investigators didn't want them influencing each other's stories. Four of the family members were huddled together on the couch, comforting each other, but Stephanie's brother Michael remained apart from them. Michael sat alone on the floor playing a video game, and this didn't go unnoticed by the officer who was watching them. His apparently cold lack of emotion gave the officer an uneasy feeling about Michael, a competent forensic psychologist might consider this self-soothing behavior, creating a desperately needed distraction in the face of a horrible situation. But to the officers on the scene, Michael was judged as being cold-hearted and strange. To them, it pointed to his possible guilt. The other family members listened closely as officers conducted their search and performed forensic tests. Police technicians dusted for fingerprints, and photographed everything. Other techs wearing orange clothing and protective eyewear sprayed illuminating chemicals and shined fluorescent lights. The police officers talked among themselves in hushed tones, seeming uncaring to Stephanie's family. Yeah, so it seems like we're already off to kind of a shaky start between the family and the investigators. I guess the, the investigators didn't share their thoughts with the family. No, but they treated them in a certain way. Yeah, they could sense. Uh, you can feel that kind of thing, I'm, I'm certain. Oh, sure. But the Crow family members were clearly in shock. How could they not be? The night before Stephanie's body was found was just like so many other ordinary school nights in their home. Steve and Cheryl ate Hamburger Helper and watched TV. And at dinner time, Stephanie had showed up. 
She had two pencil halves in her ears and a mischievous smile on her face. Steve had laughed and told her it was cute, but told her to remove them before she hurt herself. And also that night, Michael had helped Stephanie with her homework. She liked talking with her friends so much that her parents had given her a new phone with her own number for Christmas. And she spent part of that evening, like most evenings, chatting with a classmate. And that night they were talking about the movie Titanic. The two hung up after promising to talk again later. So as the family now waited in the living room, wondering how this tragedy had happened in their own home, Detective Clater came to question them. They had already answered some questions, but these were repeated and many new ones were added. The family members were suspects in the eyes of investigators, and the father, Steve, was the number one suspect. But Michael revealed that he had gone to the kitchen sometime in the night to get a glass of milk and a Tylenol after waking up with a bad headache. When asked what time that was, he said it was about 4.30 a.m., so this seemed to raise Clater's suspicions of him a great deal. Clater wondered how the boy could have walked past Stephanie's doorway and not seen her body. I thought the door was closed. Yes, he said it was closed. But when the police came, it had been opened by the grandmother, and they didn't believe him that it was closed. But the grandmother could say, I opened her door. She could say that. She could say that all she wanted, yes. But I don't think that would really change the direction they're going in. He really stared hard at the 14-year-old and thought that something didn't add up. Eventually, the grieving family members were told to go to police headquarters for further questioning. Steve didn't understand this at all, and he just felt terrible leaving the house with Stephanie's body just lying there. He wanted to refuse, but he knew he couldn't. He finally agreed, and they were all led to squad cars that were waiting for them outside. Poor Cheryl was inconsolable as they drove away from their home. Steve Crow cried again when they were at the police station. He kept saying he couldn't help her. He felt guilty. The police officer in the room watched him carefully for any signs that he was guilty. Detective Barry Sweeney entered the room with a notepad, assuring Steve that he was not under arrest and that he was free to go at any time. But Steve was first on the suspect list. And in reality, he wouldn't be going anywhere anytime soon. So Sweeney handed Steve a sketch of the house and asked him to identify the bedrooms. Steve wrote the names of family members on each room in the drawing, starting with the room he shared with his wife, Cheryl. The detective wanted to know if Steve had heard any noises in the night or if he might have gotten up for any reason. Steve said no to both questions. For 45 minutes, the detective questioned him. He then asked him to take off his clothing, and his body was inspected. He was checked for bruises and scratch marks. The detective ordered Steve to extend his arms and hands so he could examine his fingers. He turned his hands over and scraped beneath his fingernails, collecting the scrapings in an evidence bag. Yeah, so this does sound cold, but on the other hand, they kind of have to do this. Well, yes. Of course the people in the home are the primary suspects. So Steve's body was photographed as well, a set of sweats were thrown onto a chair for him to wear, and his clothing was put into evidence bags. Each member of the Crow family was questioned and examined in the same way that morning. Cheryl was just numb as she stood naked and alone. A photographer took close-ups of her body, concentrating on her hands. Stephanie's siblings, Shannon and Michael, were allowed to keep their underwear on, but they too were inspected and photographed. At 5.30 that afternoon, Michael Crow asked if he could make a phone call. He was given permission and he called his friend Joshua. So 5.30, that means he's already been there all day. Yeah. He told Joshua that he was at the police station, then he began to cry, explaining that someone had come into their house during the night and had killed his sister. He had seen her body on the floor, he told his friend and nearby an officer listened and wrote down Joshua's name in his notebook. By this time, word was out in the community that 12-year-old Stephanie Crow had been murdered. But all the family wanted to do was go home and grieve together. But they were told by Detective Clater that they couldn't go home yet. The adults were taken to a motel, and the children were taken to a county facility. Steve lost his patience and got angry at that point. He gathered up the family and told them they were leaving, 
and they started for the door, but the police stopped them. Stephanie's parents and grandmother were taken to the motel, and they were warned not to go too far away and not to go near their house. So for the first time, they realized that they really weren't free. They were exhausted emotionally and physically, and they were just sick with grief. And now everything seemed out of their control. When Shannon and Michael were taken to the Polinsky Children's Center in San Diego. This is a place for abused kids. The children were told they would be separated for the night. They begged to stay together. The Children's Center normally wouldn't allow a boy and a girl to sleep in the same room. But they were brother and sister, and they were in emotional distress. So the woman in charge agreed that they could spend the night together in the same room. Well, the police had spent the day at the Crow House. Stephanie's body wasn't removed for nine hours, as the investigators and forensic specialists went over every detail, looking for anything that would lead them to a suspect. No evidence had been found that told them who killed Stephanie, but they believed that someone who had already been inside the house had entered Stephanie's room and brutally stabbed her numerous times. Whoever it was must have been in a rage, yet he had moved quietly through the house. And Stephanie had been singled out for an unknown reason. Detective Clater's biggest problem was that a murder weapon hadn't been found. If the knife had been hidden in the house, they would have found it. Clater, Sweeney, and several other officers sat in a conference room, going over the facts, until one officer said, Michael, the 14-year-old, he didn't cry like the rest. He seemed unemotional and aloof. He explained that while the rest of the family sat together, Michael was off in a corner of the room playing with a handheld video game. Michael's parents would actually later deny this, but apparently it was enough for Clater to turn his suspicions to Michael. Clater was aware of the statistics on sibling abuse. Most of this abuse is kept hidden. The U.S. Justice Department has reported that of the roughly 20,000 murders in this country each year, one and a half percent of them are committed by a sibling against another. So this amounts to about 300 murders by one child against another in the same family every year in the U.S. So with this in mind, Michael seemed like a good suspect. Well, I see how he says that, but still, that's, that's rare. Yes, it is. It's still a rare thing. Detective Sweeney told the other investigators that he believed Steve Crow had been faking his sadness during his interrogation. But no weapon or physical evidence pointed to either Michael or Steve as Stephanie's killer. The officers talked until late that night. As more reports came in, other officers joined in the discussion. Judith Kennedy, the grandmother, was very security conscious, one officer said, and she would always check the doors to make sure they were locked at night. But two doors may have been left unlocked all night. During the questioning of the family, they had learned that Cheryl's brother, Mike Kennedy, had visited the family around dinner time on the night of the murder, and as he left, Judith asked him to lock the door behind him, but no one had gone to check it. Mike was asked if he had a key to the crow house, but he didn't. So none of the family members had been ruled out, but much of the focus was turning to 14-year-old Michael Crow. At five foot two and 100 pounds, all of the officers believed that he would have the strength to stab his sister with a knife deep enough to cause her injuries. Michael's story of going to the kitchen during the night and not seeing his sister's body in the doorway really seemed to bother the detectives. And there was another thing. Stephanie had been stabbed in bed, and she had either been carried to the doorway or she had managed to drag herself there. They believed Michael could have dragged her. On January 22nd, the day after the murder, the investigation at the house continued. Stephanie's parents and grandmother made arrangements to stay at a relative's house until they were allowed to return home. They tearfully shared their experiences at the police station with friends and relatives, telling them how they had been taken into separate rooms and questioned over and over. Their surviving children were still being held. Poor Stephanie was gone forever. Plater attended the autopsy and learned that Stephanie had not been sexually assaulted. So do you think that made him think it was less likely a stranger or more likely a stranger, if she wasn't sexually assaulted? 
I would think it'd be more likely. More likely that it was a stranger? That it was a stranger. I agree. Yeah. A family member could, but a family member intent on killing, I don't think, would sexually assault her. Probably not, unless that's where it all came from, was sexual abuse in the first place. Yeah, that's true. Just seems more like a stranger. Yeah, I think so too, but I'm not sure of the statistics on that one. But the cuts into her body had been very forceful and quite deep. She'd been stabbed nine times. Cuts on her hands and on either side of her head indicated that she had likely resisted and moved as the attacker struck her. Her clavicle bone and a vertebrae in her neck had been cut into, and these marks would help them to identify what kind of knife had been used. So once he had the murder weapon, Detective Clater thought that he'd have the murderer. But no knife had been found, at least not one that would match her injuries. There had been knives that were found at the Crow home, actually 23 in the kitchen and 16 in the garage, but none of these were the knife that had killed Stephanie. So Detective Clater was beginning to believe that this murder had been planned. In cases of rage, there are mistakes made by the killer, like leaving behind fingerprints or failing to get rid of other evidence. But people who act with intent are usually meticulous in covering their crimes. Most killers will panic after committing the crime when it's a crime of passion. But in Stephanie's case, there was really no evidence found at the house, and the detective thought that could mean it was really carefully planned out and covered up. Yeah, because they pretty much decided that it was an inside job, and they're not looking really for anybody on the outside. I think that's the big problem right from the beginning, is that's they're just going with that. And I understand you have to rule out the family, but I don't think they kept their minds as open as they should have. Yeah. So inside the house, the search for evidence had moved on to a new phase. The police were cutting holes in the walls, pulling out toilets, and looking into all of the drains. Stephanie's room was completely torn apart. The wallboards, the bed, her clothing, the drapes, and the carpet were all removed. But no bloody clothes or a weapon had been found. Yeah, there were no signs that anyone had washed blood up in the bathroom or in the kitchen or anything. So Clater made phone calls to the coroner and the lab techs who had examined the house. The coroner said he had nothing further to add. So Clater decided that he would follow his gut feeling that Michael was involved. So around noon on day two, Clater told Sweeney to bring Michael in from the Polinsky Children's Center. Institutionalized with strangers, Michael and Shannon were wondering where their parents were. They weren't even allowed to talk to them. They talked, they cried, and they comforted each other the best they could. They still had no idea what had happened to Stephanie, but they had seen her dead body, and they had seen their parents and their grandmother completely devastated. So they were just waiting and worrying. Michael was taken back to police headquarters in Escondido, and as they drove, the officers looked at Michael, and they tried to determine if he was capable of murdering his sister. Michael was a bright boy with a high IQ. When they talked with the 14-year-old, they recognized that he had the vocabulary of someone older. He also had a very practical way of thinking about things. He loved science because he found truth in it, he said. Michael also often wore black clothing, and they held that against him as well. He said it made him feel different from the other kids, and he wasn't into sports, so he was considered a bit of a loner. His teachers, though, said he was so advanced that he could enroll in college early. But a problem with that was that in the current school year, his grades had gone downhill. Michael had complained about the absurdity of being made to copy down the questions for tests instead of just writing the answers. So all of his personality quirks played a part in building up suspicions around Michael. He also loved to play violent video games, and the police saw this fixation as potentially sinister. When Michael came home from school each day, he would usually go right to his room and play video games like Tomb Raider or Final Fantasy VII. Organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics 
and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry previously agreed that exposure to violent media, including video games, can contribute to real-life violent behavior. But other researchers question the validity of much of the research supporting this view. They argue that most youths are not affected by violent video games. In a more recent report published in Springer's Journal of Youth and Adolescence, they linked aggressiveness and stress with youth violence rather than playing violent video games. Well, and that kind of makes sense, that real stress or violence or aggressiveness would have more of an effect on your behavior than the games you're playing. Oh, definitely. But this is back in 1998, and the prevalent belief was that violent video games, music, and films could make children violent. This view must have been shared by these investigators who interviewed Michael because they saw his video game obsession as a sign of his exaggerated potential to be a violent person in real life. In the early afternoon of January 22nd, again, this is just the next day, Right. Michael was taken back to police headquarters where he was met by Detective Mark Risley, who had also questioned Michael the day before. Risley repeated the Miranda rights statement making sure Michael understood he had the right to remain silent and that anything he said could be used against him in a court of law. Michael said he did understand and agreed to answer the detective's questions anyway, without an attorney present or a family member, parent. Well, and in my opinion, I don't think a 14-year-old should be able to make that decision for himself. Well, these days, they can't. Oh, they can. In the U.S., they can. Oh, a 14-year-old cannot be questioned alone. Uh, I don't know about that, Dickie. Where did you get that? Oh, someplace I read it. (laughs) Okay. Uh, I don't know if that's actually a law, but we'll go over more of that definitely a little bit later in this conversation. But But I can... The upshoot is that he was questioned by himself. He was. And I could understand, even being a smart kid, he'd say, well, sure. He wouldn't even think that they would be considering him as a suspect for killing his sister. Right. So he's just really thinking he's helping. Yeah, he's got nothing to hide. Yeah. Risley began the questioning in a friendly way, too, so he was sneaky. He said that he was there only to gather information. Mostly, Michael was asked to go over what had happened the night before Stephanie's death. He went over the same questions that each family member had answered the day before. And Michael gave the same answers. Yes, he thought all the doors of the house had been locked. But he remembered that after going to bed, he had heard a knock at one of the doors. This got Risley's attention. He wanted to know, was this a loud knock or more like a rap? And Michael wasn't sure. He said he was half asleep and pretty sure it wasn't one of his friends or anything, nothing he needed to be concerned about. Risley wanted Michael to estimate what time that had happened, and Michael said he was pretty sure it was before midnight. Risley was aware that the county chief medical examiner had estimated the time of death as no later than 12.30 a.m., but they'd also said it could have been as early as 9 p.m., depending on the time when Stephanie had eaten her last meal. But Risley moved on to another time, 4.30 in the morning. That's when Michael had said he'd woken up with a terrible headache and walked to the kitchen for a Tylenol and a glass of milk. He had turned on his TV set, he told them, so he could see to make his way out of the room. He said that Stephanie's door had been closed and he didn't see anything unusual. But when Stephanie was found dead later that morning, the door was open. And this was seen as suspicious. I still can't get past the grandmother opened the door. I know. I know. But they thought that was suspicious, that he should have seen her. But remember, there was a little alcove, and he said the door was shut. And when the grandma came in in the morning... The door wasn't shut all the way, but, you know, a killer probably came in or left at that point. So I don't know, but I guess the whole point is that they did see it as suspicious, regardless of what we might think about it right now. Yeah. So Michael said he returned to his room around 4.45 a.m. He'd gone to the kitchen at 4.30. Now, to Risley, that seemed like a very long time to drink a glass of milk and take a Tylenol. He asked about this, and Michael said he'd had a little trouble opening up the Tylenol bottle. Well, yeah, they're almost impossible. (laughs) Risley believed it was impossible for anyone to walk past Stephanie's bedroom door twice without seeing her body, and he suspected that Michael was lying. 
So the only way you could think that's impossible is if you don't believe him when he says the door was shut. It's that not. simple to me. Yeah. So on the second day, the investigation had continued at the Crow House, and the frustrations of the investigators were growing. No physical evidence had yet been found pointing to anyone as her killer. Not even the hair fibers under Stephanie's fingernails were identified, except that some of them were animal hair, and it was assumed that those were picked up when she crawled from her bed toward the bedroom door. The conclusion was that whoever had murdered Stephanie was a calculating person who knew how to put a strategy together and follow through without leaving any evidence behind. And that just seems like a stretch to assume that or conclude that. It does. So the investigative team kept coming back to Michael as the killer. Absolutely they did. He was an expert at games, which required fast thinking, planning, and strategy. He was in the house, and he was up at 4.30 in the morning, claiming he didn't see his sister's body in her bedroom doorway. None of the detectives believed Michael's story. When Risley left the interrogation room, Detective Plater came in, and he was acting very serious. So he was kind of like the bad cop in a good cop, bad cop scenario. He told Michael that they had evidence that he had killed his sister, and Michael started to cry and said he didn't do it. Michael was told that there could be a good Michael and a bad Michael, and the bad Michael could have killed Stephanie without him even knowing it. So that's something, huh? That's just trying to confuse him. Another thing they did is they told him to write a letter of apology to his sister. So he did that, but he didn't really confess. He said, if I did this, I don't remember, and I'm so sorry, something like that. You know, I'm paraphrasing. But then he was also given a computer voice stress analysis test. Yeah, this is sort of the poor man's lie detector test. Oh, yeah. Michael told Clater, I've spent two days away from my family. I couldn't see them. I'm being treated like I killed my sister, but I didn't, and it feels horrible. I'm being blamed. Everything I own is gone. I spend all day in clothes other than my own. I mean, everything I have is gone. Everything. And you won't even let me see my family. It's just horrible. Makes sense to me. So in response to that, I guess, Clater's aggressiveness diminished. And he said sympathetically, Mike, you have to trust me on this. Clater then left the room and returned with another detective. This was Chris McDonough from the Oceanside Police Department. McDonough was friendly. He set up the computer voice stress analyzer, telling Michael that its accuracy is phenomenal. The device works on the theory that a voice emits audible vibrations called micro tremors, which can be measured on a graph. And under stress, when someone lies, for example, the vocal muscles tighten and cause a decrease in the tremors. But independent studies of the accuracy of this device show that its actual reliability was less than a coin flip in determining deception. Huh, that's reassuring. So it wasn't really used that much to determine deception. I think it was more of a tool to approach Michael with and intimidate him. Another way to say we have evidence against you. Right. When they didn't. But, you know, using a tool like this to fool the suspect is completely legal, as is lying to him about finding evidence that didn't really exist. So after asking questions for about eight minutes, Michael was told that he had failed the test. Lying when asked if he knew who had taken his sister's life. Michael denied it, but McDonough was no longer being friendly with him. Michael was let go after six hours of interrogation that day. When the Escondido police returned Michael to the Polinsky Children's Center that night, he was exhausted and confused. But police were now convinced that Michael was an angry teen who had killed his sister in a rage-filled case of sibling rivalry. Okay. Even though there's really not any evidence of that. I was just going to say, I haven't heard anything remotely resembling sibling rivalry or friction tension between the two. No. No, not really. I mean... When he starts talking to Michael's friends, we might hear some of that, but that's a whole other problem. So Michael was brought back to the police station for further interrogation the next day. He was devastated with the idea of facing more hours of interrogation, but he felt he had no choice. He was told that his parents believed he's guilty, and they, the interrogators, were all he had left in the world. Isn't that just cruel? Isn't it? Yeah. 
Michael is taken off camera to tell him this, and when he returns to the interrogation room, he seems more relaxed, like he has given up. He confesses to killing his sister, but he never gives one single accurate detail of how he stabbed his sister to death. But he is arrested and charged with murder and taken away to juvenile prison. And let's not forget that leaves Shannon alone. Right. In the other facility. And remember, Michael's parents didn't even know that their son was being interrogated. No one had even talked to them about it. All they knew was that Michael and Shannon were being held at the Polinsky Children's Center for their own good. So Steve Crow had not slept since Stephanie's death. Someone suggested sleeping pills to him, and he decided to take one that night. Just after midnight, the phone rang, and Steve woke up and fumbled for it. And through his sleep fog, he listened carefully. It was a detective on the line who told him, We've arrested a suspect. Then, he added, It's your son. So Steve's mind just couldn't comprehend what he was being told. Before this, they weren't even aware that Michael was being talked to or considered a suspect. Detectives went to Michael's friend Joshua Treadway's house. They saw a knife in plain view there, on top of a couch in the living room. When Joshua was asked who owned the knife, he said it was his brother's. But when his brother was questioned about that knife, he said it belonged to Joshua. Right, so then the police just kind of jumped to Joshua being involved in Stephanie's murder. Yeah, so they got a search warrant obtained for the Treadway house. Probable cause was based on Joshua being Michael's best friend and that Michael had called Joshua from the police station on the morning of the murder and that a knife meeting the description of the murder weapon had been seen at the Treadway house. So Margaret Hauser, the mother of another friend of Michael's, Aaron Hauser, called the police before the search warrant was executed and she told them that Aaron had a knife with a four to five inch blade missing from his collection because Aaron had a big knife collection. So the police went ahead and got a warrant for the Hauser's house as well. Aaron Hauser was interrogated that same day, and this lasted about one and a half hours, and the focus of the questioning was Michael's possible involvement in his sister's murder. Aaron told the detectives that as far as he knew, Michael did not get along with his parents, and he had a make-believe list of people he would kill. But Aaron didn't make any self-incriminating statements. While the Treadway and Hauser residents were being searched, Joshua Treadway was interrogated at the police station. His father, Mr. Treadway, believed that the police were not after his son. After all, he thought Joshua had only hidden a knife, so the other kids had used Joshua without Joshua even knowing it. And he didn't want his son protecting anyone who could have killed the little girl. So Treadway was more than happy to provide help to the police and to let them talk to Joshua all they wanted. So Clater was very friendly with Mr. and Mrs. Treadway, and he made it clear that Joshua was a good boy who was being used by the bad boys. So that way he got Joshua's parents on his side. And at this point, he had Michael's parents on his side as well. Michael's parents thought, well, why would the police lie? Maybe right. Michael did kill Stephanie. They're very confused and, you know, upset is a huge understatement. But Joshua's interrogation began at 7 p.m. and it did not end until 8.15 the following morning. Joshua was arrested for stealing Aaron Hauser's knife. Two knives were found under his bed. One had a five and a half inch blade and the other had a six inch blade. Joshua admitted to stealing the knife from Aaron, but he denied any involvement in Stephanie's murder. But over the hours of questioning, Joshua changed his story. He told detectives that he had gotten the knife from Aaron and that Aaron had told him it was the knife that had been used to kill Stephanie. But Joshua was questioned again on February 10th. This time, after about 12 more hours of questioning, wow. remember that, 12 hours. It's a long time. He gave what seemed to be a detailed account of the events leading up to the murder. He said that he had acted as a lookout while Aaron and Michael committed the murder. He also said that Michael was always complaining about Stephanie, and he'd said that he'd like to kill her, but Joshua was arrested for the murder. Right, then Clater wanted Joshua to call Aaron and talk to him about the murder, and he wanted to record that conversation, so of course Joshua was very pressured to do this. 
He knew he had to do it, not just because the police wanted him to, but now the parents are on the side of the police and they want him to do it. So Joshua really had nothing against Aaron. In fact, Aaron was his friend. So it made him feel very guilty making this call. If only he had not told them that Aaron had given him the knife to hide. If only he denied it, then none of this would be happening. But he dialed the number and Aaron's mother answered the phone. She wouldn't let Aaron take the call. Plater had given her strict orders that Aaron was not supposed to have contact with Michael or Joshua. So Joshua was relieved by this, feeling he was off the hook. Yeah, phew. Right. But nope, Plater told Mr. Treadway to call Aaron's mother back and tell her it was okay if Aaron and Joshua talked. And for some reason that was okay with her, and she put Aaron on the phone with Joshua. Is this Josh? Aaron asked when he picked up the phone. And Joshua said what he had been told to say by Clater. Yeah, can you talk, he asked. I'm in my room alone. Joshua held the phone in a death grip. He told Aaron that he was scared. The police had taken him in and interrogated him. They were asking me about blood on the knife, Joshua said. Are you sure it was cleaned off? This was a gotcha question given to Joshua by Detective Clater. Why would it be cleaned, Aaron asked him. I don't need to clean it, do I? Joshua (laughs) said that he had been given the knife by Aaron. Then Aaron was figuring out what's going on here. He raised his voice in alarm, and he said, At no point did I hand my knife over to you, correct? If Aaron didn't readily admit giving Joshua the knife, Clater hoped that he might offer some other self-incriminating statement. But Aaron demanded of Josh, Tell me what you believe happened. He was unnerved by what Joshua had said and couldn't figure out what this strange conversation was all about. You gave me the knife on Sunday, and you gave me instructions to get rid of it, Joshua said, of course being encouraged by the detective. But Aaron was incredulous. Now he realized there was more to this phone call than a friendly check-in from Josh. He could sense trouble and wanted to end it. Did you say I gave you the knife on Sunday with instructions to get rid of it? Aaron asked him. And Joshua said, yes, I did. Tell me, Josh, why would I do that? Aaron correctly suspected that there were more people listening in on this call than just Joshua. Joshua looked at his father and then at Clater, who had prepared these questions. Look, he said, I'm really sorry they found the knife. I mean, do we need a plan? Why would we need a plan, Josh? Aaron asked him. He didn't know exactly where this conversation was leading, but he wasn't going to go along with it. So Joshua looked at Detective Clater again, and the detective prompted him to say more. Joshua said, You gave me the knife, Aaron, told me it was the knife Michael used to kill Stephanie, and told me to get rid of it. But Aaron said he never said that. He said, Never at any point did I say that. I had nothing to do with Michael Crow. I would never help kill someone, would I? I mean, if Michael killed his sister, if that really happened, which there's no proof of, And personally, I can't imagine Michael killing anyone. Can you? So this Aaron is very mature. Yeah, he sure is. Yeah, the way he spoke, it was just impressive to me. And he's the only one who doesn't give a confession. Joshua, at Clater's prompting, continued to insist that Aaron had given him the knife to hide. Aaron repeated his denials. And frustrated, he eventually cut Joshua off and hung up the phone. Joshua was trembling, and Clater assured him he had done just fine. So Aaron Hauser was arrested on February 11th and questioned again. Aaron did not admit to any involvement in Stephanie's murder, but he did explain to the detectives how he would have done the killing hypothetically and how he would have hidden the evidence. Yeah, so he did fall for that old ploy. Yeah. Well, we know you didn't do it, but if you did do it, you know, how would you do it? Yeah, you know, you're, you're a smart kid. Right. Figure out how it could have been done. (laughs) Yeah. So these three boys were all arrested and two of them had confessed. But let's go back to the night before Stephanie was killed. That was January 20th, 1998. Because there actually is an alternate suspect. That night, police were called about a transient named Richard Raymond Tewitt, who'd been bothering people in the vicinity of the Crows neighborhood. And witnesses said that he seemed either drunk or high. One witness heard him yell, I'm going to kill you, fucking bitch. And another witness saw him spinning around in circles. Between 7 and 8 p.m., Tewitt entered one house after the occupant mistook his knock for that of a neighbor 
and accidentally let him in. Tuit repeatedly asked for Tracy. After repeatedly telling him she didn't know Tracy, the occupant was able to get Tuit to leave her house. But that wasn't the end of it, was it? No, it wasn't. At 9.18 p.m., Gary West, who is a neighbor of the Crows, called the police to report a transient who had knocked on his door and had said he was looking for a girl. The officer who came out to the neighborhood drove up to the Crow house. He saw a motion light come on over the garage door when he pulled up. He also saw that the door next to the garage door was open. He could see inside because there were lights on in the house. The door closed as he pulled up, but he couldn't see who closed it. In his log, he wrote that the transient was gone on arrival. Uh, this was just before 10 p.m. So my understanding with this is that he turned around in the crow's driveway. He didn't pull into their driveway necessarily knowing who they were, but he did see that door shut when he pulled up. And then, for whatever reason, the officer just assumed that the transient was gone. But he hadn't really done anything, so I guess you don't really spend your night looking for him. But it turns out that Tuit had been in trouble off and on since he was 14 years old. By his 21st birthday, he had been arrested several times for drug abuse and for theft. His troubles with the police started early. In the beginning, it was just small stuff. But in 1990, Tuit was arrested for car theft, evading officers, and reckless driving. While incarcerated, Tuit would drift in and out of reality, and he had severe mood changes. Later on, Tuit was diagnosed as a chronic schizophrenic, but he was determined not to be a danger to others. When word got out the morning of January 21st about the murder of Stephanie, some of the neighbors did tell police about a strange-looking man with long, dirty blonde hair and a beard roaming the neighborhood the night before. The police quickly matched this description to Tuit, who was actually well-known to them. So on February 12, 1998, the day after Aaron was arrested, Tuit had sat on a bus headed toward a section of San Diego called Hillcrest. The bus stopped to pick up passengers, and Tuit watched a woman and a man climb aboard with the woman's daughter, 12-year-old Karen, and her friend, 13-year-old Summer. Both of these girls noticed Tuit's ragged appearance as he looked back at them, and he began circling his lips with his tongue in a vulgar way. The girls told Karen's mother, and to escape his gaze, the girls put their jackets over their heads. The girls, Karen's mother, and Karen's mother's friend Hector, were grateful when it was time to get off the bus and transfer to one that would take them to Escondido. But to it followed them, sitting even closer to the girls this time, and repeating that lewd act with his tongue. When Hector, Karen, her mother, and Summer finally reached their stop, Tuit followed them off of the bus again. Karen's mother and Hector walked the girls to their gated apartment complex, and after seeing them safely inside, they walked across the street to a store to get something cold to drink. But Tuit had followed them to the apartments, and he had somehow gotten through the gates, following the girls into the apartment complex. So as you can imagine, the girls were even more frightened when Tuit began yelling, Tracy and saying he wanted to have sex with them. He became angry, and the girls ran to Karen's mother, who was just returning from the store. So she called the police, and the police found Tuit at a nearby Taco Bell restaurant. They did arrest him for annoying a child. But just remember that on the night of Stephanie Crow's murder, Tuit was in the Crow neighborhood looking for Tracy. And Tracy was not a figment of Tuit's imagination, either. No, she had lived near the Crow house for two or three years before the murder. Tracy used to hang out with Tuit and use methamphetamine, but she ultimately overcame her addiction, and she moved two hours away. By all accounts, Tuit never accepted the reality of Tracy leaving. At the same time, he also began a mental decline, becoming more unkempt, more incoherent, and more confused. On the evening of January 22nd, the day after Stephanie had been found dead, Tuit was seen inside an Escondido laundromat by a patrolman. He was taken in for questioning. Detective Barry Sweeney, who had been involved from the beginning of the Crow case, told Tuit that there had been a murder in the west end of Escondido and wanted to know if Tuit had contacted anyone there. Tuit's memory seemed okay since he admitted to talking to several people in the area, 
but he insisted he had not gone inside anyone's house. Well, the police did take fingernail scrapings and clippings and examined his hands and arms. They did find that he had a one and a half inch cut on his right palm. So that's very suspicious. That should have set off some alarms. They also took to its clothing black jeans, black Nike shoes, and a white t-shirt and a turtleneck sweatshirt. But they forgot to fingerprint him. Now they already have his fingerprints on file because he's been arrested many times. But a patrolman was sent out to bring into it again the next day and they did do fingerprints and he was released again. Then three days later, the police were called to a Best Western motel where a transient was reported looking into car windows. Again, this was to it. When the officer asked to it why he was there, he said he was looking for the family of the little girl who got killed. The cop searched to it and finding no weapons or drugs on him, let him go. But it's noteworthy to say that this motel was the same place where the crows had stayed after the murder. So somehow he had known that or had some idea. So Tuit should have been a serious suspect in Stephanie Crow's murder. But with Tuit, the police had not even bothered to videotape their brief interrogation. So that's another thing that just is mind-boggling. And the only explanation I can come up with is they'd already decided that it was Michael. Yeah, sure seems that Tuit's a viable suspect. Yeah, but the police had tunnel vision. Tuit definitely could have been the killer, but the police report showed that no blood was found on his clothing and there was no match of his fingerprints at the house either. But we'll talk more about that as we go through this. Yes, let's. But certainly a viable suspect that was overlooked more than once. In May of 1998, a grand jury issued indictments against the boys, Aaron, Joshua, and Michael, for murder and conspiracy to commit murder. They were incarcerated for six months as prosecutors prepared for trial. But then, as Joshua's trial was about to begin in January of 1999, new DNA testing by an independent Bay Area lab identified drops of Stephanie's blood onto its sweatshirt which actually had some visible stains on it. Then the blood was also determined to be in a spatter pattern, which you would get in a stabbing. The Escondido police had run tests on Tuit's white t-shirt, but not on his red turtleneck sweatshirt. Later, a state crime laboratory would also find Stephanie's blood on the hem of Tuit's white t-shirt. So, mistakes were clearly made. Yes, they were. And based on this new evidence, the charges against the boys were dismissed without prejudice. But that means that allows for charges to be reinstated at a later date. But even then, the prosecutor would not concede that Richard Tuit was possibly the murderer. She actually had several theories as explanations for the blood being found on his red sweatshirt. She theorized that the Escondido police had co-mingled other bloodied evidence with the red sweatshirt, without any reason for thinking that, no evidence of that. And this is despite the fact that Tuit's clothing had been collected after the murder and had been packaged separately from all the other evidence. So that's just a case of not wanting to admit you're wrong, which is ridiculous in that situation. Yeah, well, they're going to hold on to that story till the very end. They're not letting it go easily, that's for sure. In May 2002, the California Attorney General's office took over the case, and they charged Tuit with murdering Stephanie. Finally. His trial began in February 2004. On the first day of jury selection, Tuit walked away from the courtroom holding tank during the lunch hour. He had gotten out of his handcuffs, left the building, and gotten onto a bus. So the police here are looking so bad. He was caught hours later. In his trial, the prosecution linked to it to Stephanie's murder with both circumstantial and physical evidence. And this, of course, included the evidence of Stephanie's blood on his clothing, because why else would her blood be on his clothing? But to its defense was that the boys had killed Stephanie and that her blood was on his clothing as a result of contamination caused by careless police handling of evidence. But we've talked about this many, many times about if you don't have a defense, the defense is that the police messed things up. 
It worked for OJ. It works quite often, it seems. Yeah, well, you have to find some way to explain the damning evidence. Absolutely. I don't blame the defense attorney for doing it, but it's kind of ludicrous if you think about it. So on May 26, 2004, Tewitt was acquitted of murder, but he was convicted of voluntary manslaughter. He was also found guilty of use of a deadly weapon, and he was sentenced to 13 years in prison. He had another four years added to his sentence for his escape from the courthouse. The families of Joshua, Michael, and Aaron sued the cities of Oceanside and Escondido, and the Crows accepted a settlement of $7.25 million in 2011. Then, in 2012, a judge made a ruling that all three of the boys are factually innocent. Factually innocent. And the charges were then, finally, permanently dismissed against them. But that isn't the end of the story. Oh, no. Richard Tewitt appealed his conviction on several issues, including that his Sixth Amendment rights were violated because he was precluded from fully cross-examining one of the prosecution's witnesses. In December 2006, the Court of Appeals affirmed his conviction in a lengthy unpublished opinion. The court found that the trial judge had made a constitutional error in limiting the cross-examination, but held the error to be harmless and affirmed the conviction. Yeah, and the Supreme Court of California denied a review of this decision, and the federal district court denied to its petition for habeas corpus. But then, fast forward to September 2011, and a panel of the U.S. Court of Appeals voted 2-1 to to overturn to its manslaughter conviction. They ruled that the trial was unfair because the trial judge limited cross-examination of a prosecution witness. So the same grounds, but a different decision. Yeah. This panel stated in its opinion that the decision was made because of the lack of evidence tying to it to the crime, the problems with the DNA evidence, and the jury's compromised verdict of voluntary manslaughter. So that's how they saw the manslaughter conviction, is they didn't want to go with murder, but they didn't think he was innocent, and I'm not sure how that all occurred in the deliberations. But it was noted that during the trial, the prosecution couldn't produce any trace evidence from the house on the defendant's clothing or person, nor was any trace evidence of the defendant's person or clothing found in the house. So this led to a determination that there was a lack of evidence against to it. It just seems crazy to me that they could accept that with Stephanie's blood being identified on his clothing and no evidence that there was cross-contamination. It just seems really insane that the <laughs> prosecution could accept that decision with Stephanie's blood being identified on to its clothing. Well, yeah, that's what I was saying. Holy cow. Well, right, but they were going to go ahead with prosecution of the three boys with no trace evidence. So it just does not show very good police work done by these guys. To it was granted a retrial, which began on October 24, 2013. And in closing arguments, his attorney told jurors that To it had never been in the Crow House and wouldn't have been able to find Stephanie's bedroom in the dark home. In addition, he said, investigators did not find his fingerprints or DNA in the residence. So I don't know. I think that he had to do it, in my opinion. Yeah. And if you're just going in and stabbing someone to death, you're not necessarily going to leave fingerprints or DNA. Well, but besides the the blood on his sweatshirt or whatever. Right. He was just in the area. Yes. Around the time of her murder. Yep, he was. And he did go into one person's house, we know for sure. Yeah. So, okay. So just kind of a fuck up, I guess. Just it's a very good thing that those three boys didn't end up in prison for life. To its attorney said Stephanie must have been held under a comforter to keep her quiet while someone else stabbed her. So she's saying it had to be more than one person. And she also said that experts testified that the bloodstains on To its shirts were not there when those shirts were originally evaluated and got there through contamination during the crime scene analysis. But that doesn't make sense either because the blood was in a spatter pattern. And if you're just commingling things, you might get like a little DNA rubbed off, but I don't think you'd get droplets of blood. That doesn't seem likely. No. 
The prosecutor said during her closing argument that Tewitt was in the area of the Crow home the night Stephanie was killed. He was knocking on doors and looking for a woman named Tracy, at whom he was angry because she had turned him away a couple of years earlier. He was obsessed and delusional, she added. According to the prosecutor, Tewitt wandered into the Crow home at about 10 p.m. through an open door, and once he got inside the house, she couldn't be sure exactly what happened, of course, but Tewitt went into Stephanie's bedroom and stabbed her at least nine times, getting her blood on two shirts that he was wearing when contacted by the police the next day. But on December 5, 2013, the jury returned with a verdict of not guilty. Afterwards, a juror said there was no evidence that Tuit was ever in the Crow residence that night and that the jurors were concerned that the victim's blood may have gotten onto his shirts through contamination. He must have had a good lawyer to get the jury to believe that. No kidding. You have to think that maybe the horrible police work with Michael Crow led the jurors to think the police were just incompetent and could have mishandled this evidence. Yeah, because it's just... It seems like a solid case against to it. it. It does. I don't know if it's the most solid case I've ever heard of, but oh, no. it uh, seems like it's more reasonable to think it was him than Michael Crow. Oh, certainly. So before we wrap up and do our listener feedback, let's just talk a little bit about the read technique. That's an interrogation method that was used by investigators in this case, and Dick's going to tell us a little bit about it, right? This method of interrogation was built around psychological techniques, but has employed trickery and deceit. It was first published in 1962 and laid out a process of interrogation to get a suspected criminal to confess to a crime. These days, the read technique is taught to and used by thousands of interrogators and police departments all over the country. There are three stages to the technique. Stage one, the fact analysis, involves the collection and analysis of the crime's facts. Stage 2, the behavior analysis interview, is a non-accusatory interview designed to gather facts and behavioral information about the possible suspects. But the heart of the read technique is stage 3, and it's nine steps of interrogation. Yeah, so this is where we get into trouble, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, I think in the first two steps, you're really kind of befriending your suspect. Especially with a child, it's very easy to do. Make them think you're on their side. And then they turn to the accusatory process. So what happens there? Well, that's where the investigator tells the suspect that the evidence clearly shows he committed the crime. Right. And basically, there's no way out. The claim of evidence may be the truth, may be conjecture, or may even be completely false. As the interrogator weaves together their narrative of the crime, they come across as non-demeaning and understanding. The interrogator uses sets of psychological themes as potential moral justification for why the suspect did what he did. Yeah, and I think, you know, an example of that, I'm going to go back again to the Chris Watts trial, where the police officer or the detective who was interviewing him said, Chris, did she do something to the kids and then you killed her? So that's giving him kind of a plausible justification. Mm -hmm. And lots of times if the suspect did do it, they'll jump on that. And that is why it does work. And this theme developed by the investigator through interaction with the suspect really is the key to this kind of interrogation. Yeah, the theme gives the impression to the suspect that it minimizes the suspect's responsibility for the crime and its legal consequences. Absolutely. One obvious danger of this form of interrogation is that children, as well as adults, can be led to falsely confess, such as the case of the New York Central Park Five in 1989. Five teenage boys, all of them black, were wrongly tried and convicted of the rape and brutal beating of a white female jogger, based in part on coerced confessions. Thirteen years passed with them in prison before they were finally exonerated. Yeah, so Michael, Aaron, and Joshua were lucky that they weren't in prison for years before the case was dropped against them. But, you know, police interrogations in the United States especially are focused on one thing, and that's getting a confession from the suspect. So this read technique, which you could call it guilt presumptive, right? It's the most common interrogation technique in the country, 
and it is successful in getting confessions. Using this guidance with the read technique, interrogators use coercion and deceit to extract confessions from their suspects. But especially when used with juvenile suspects, this method is very problematic. Now, according to a New York University Law Review article by Ariel Spearer from November 2017, titled The Right to Remain a Child, The Impermissibility of the Read Technique in Juvenile Interrogations, the coercion and deception inherent in the read technique, coupled with the vulnerabilities of children as a group, has led to an unacceptably high rate of false confession among juveniles. Yeah, the Supreme Court has recognized that children are different from adults and must be treated differently in the criminal justice system, and Spear suggests that the read technique be banned from juvenile interrogations through a constitutional ruling from the court. In juvenile interrogation, a less coercive alternative could be used, like the United Kingdom's PEACE method, P-E-A-C-E, and these guidelines consist of five distinct parts with the acronym PEACE. So there's preparation and planning. Interviewers are taught to properly prepare and plan for the interview and formulate aims and objectives. Then the E is engage and explain. Rapport is established with the suspect and officers engage the person in conversation. The A is account. Officers are taught two methods of eliciting an account from the interviewee. There's the cognitive interview and the conversation management, which is recommended when cooperation is insufficient. Then there's C, closure, where the officer summarizes the main points from the interview and provides the suspect with the opportunity to correct or add any information. And I think that's important to just give them that opportunity instead of having them all boxed in to what the interrogator is saying. And then the last of it is another E for evaluate. And once the interview is finished, the information gathered must be evaluated in the context of its impact on the investigation. So the guidelines do not allow for any accusatory interrogation with juveniles. Yeah, so essentially the peace model is the initial step in the read technique and that is a non-accusatory fact-finding interview. The difference is that in the PEACE model, they are not allowed to engage in the interrogation process in which the investigator attempts to persuade the suspect to tell the truth about what they did. Which is where they run into problems a lot. I'm sure it works for them sometimes when the suspect is guilty, but it also causes a lot of problems when the suspect is not guilty. And there are opponents to this proposed change, and they argue that peace severely limits the investigator's ability to solve these cases. Author Donald McGinnis writes that children should never be interrogated by police without the presence of a parent and without first consulting a lawyer. So he has proposed a new Miranda warning for children, as well as a children's bill of rights. Currently, many states have laws that provide juveniles with special protections during their police interrogation. But the problem is that these laws vary from state to state. Some states provide that a juvenile's parent or guardian must be present for a Miranda advisement in any ensuing interrogation. So I think that's what you were referring to earlier, but it is not in every state. Does that surprise you? Yeah, a little bit. It should, (laughs) because I think it's terrible. There are other states who require that the child be allowed to consult with his or her parent or guardian before being questioned, so that doesn't require a lawyer. But there are still some states that don't require an adult's approval and judge the admissibility of the juvenile's statements the same way as an adult statement is judged. So that is scary. On September 13, 2022, Governor Newsom signed the Juvenile Custodial Interrogations Reform Bill into law, and this made California the fourth state in the country to institute reforms prohibiting the use of coercive, manipulative, and deceptive law enforcement interrogation tactics on youth. Designed to prevent false confessions, the bill is supported by the California Innocence Coalition. Yeah, but isn't that sad that it's only the fourth state out of 50? Four down, 46 to go. Wow. Oh, wow, wow. So starting in 2024, California law enforcement will be prohibited from using threats, physical harm, deception, or psychologically manipulative interrogation tactics 
on people 17 years old and younger. Different interrogation tactics have proven to be more effective, such as the PEACE method, which builds rapport and allows the suspect to give their account of events uninterrupted before investigators present any evidence of inconsistencies or contradictions. So I think that's a very positive step, obviously, and I hope that it goes on to other states. I'm really going to look into that and see what's been proposed in other states, because it's really scary, especially if you're a child who doesn't have a parent that's really going to be supportive or doesn't know enough to look out for you. Yeah, I was going to say, hopefully have parents that are on your side. Yeah, but in this case, look at how they were able to get Joshua Treadway's parents on their side saying, well, your boy's good, and yada, yada, yada. So they're fully on the side. And even in the beginning, Michael's parents were thinking, well, wow, how could Michael have killed Stephanie? But, you know, the police say so. Why would they say it if it wasn't true? And that's nothing against the parents. It's just that a lot of parents don't know any better. A lot of people trust what the police tell them, and it's sad that they can't, but they really can't. So with that, hanging over our heads. Let's go on to feedback. Let's do that. Okay. It's time for listener feedback. All right, so today we're just doing emails. We have gotten some uh, voicemails, but we haven't had a chance to go through those yet. So those will be on the next episode, I presume? You presume, right. Okay. So, Dickie, why don't you read the comment suggestion from Jessica, and I will do the next one. Okay. Yeah, Jessica wanted us to look at the case of Alana Steinberg. Uh, In 1981, she was stabbed to death by her husband. His defense was kind of unique. His defense was that he was sleepwalking and was in a dissociative state when the murder occurred. And guess what? The jury acquitted him. That is stunning. Wow. His defense attorney must have been something. Must have been. Because I wouldn't believe that ever. Yeah, so he claimed that he had stabbed his wife to death while sleepwalking. He also said that he was driven temporarily insane by his wife's endless (laughs) nagging for more money. Oh, come on. That can't be serious. He hired a lawyer who specialized in the insanity defense, and the inexperienced Scottsdale police were accused of doing a shoddy investigation. Prosecuting attorney made a case only for premeditated murder. Ah. And with just that choice, the jury returned a verdict of not guilty. I see. Well, that makes it a little more likely that that could happen. The husband described his wife as a spoiled, overindulgent brat, the stereotypical Jewish-American princess who drove him out of his mind with his spending and her demands that he be more successful. Good God. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Let's put all these stereotypes on. Well, for fuck's sake, that just sounds outrageous. We're going to look more into this case because that's horrible. If your wife's nagging you, you can leave. So he was just saying that he was sleeping and so bothered by it that he got up in his sleep and killed her. Yeah. Basically. And he got off. Okay. Well, there's a book about this case that actually is in my uh, wish list on Amazon. So I think I'll go ahead and buy that. Thank you, Jessica. It's fascinating. Our next email is from A. Maru with a comment and a case suggestion. Leith Van Stein and his wife, Bonnie, were attacked in July 1998 in an apparent home invasion. Leith was killed. Bonnie, despite severe injuries, survived. His stepson, Chris Pritchard, had hired two friends to do the killing. The motive was money. Chris expected to inherit the family business. So I looked up a little more about this and the early morning attack that left Von Stein dead and his wife Bonnie severely wounded became a national story. In the aftermath of the murder and the sentencing of three young men for their parts in the murder, assault, and other related crimes, Two books and two made-for-TV movies about the case were released. They told the story of a young man plotting to kill his family so he could inherit an estate valued at nearly $2 million. It was almost a year before arrests were made. The first came on June 15, 1989, when James Bartlett Upchurch III was arrested. Upchurch had attended North Carolina State University with Pritchard. 
Pritchard was arrested on June 16, 1989, so the next day, when he was at his mother's home in the Winston-Salem area. Then the final suspect, Gerald Neal Henderson, was arrested June 20, 1989, in Raleigh. Charges of first-degree burglary, conspiracy to commit murder, and possession of stolen goods were dismissed in exchange for his guilty pleas. Henderson was the main prosecution witness against Upchurch. In 1998, during an interview for a Daily News article about the 10th anniversary of these crimes, John Taylor, one of the Washington Police Department investigators assigned to the case, said, I think there are more people who knew about it before and after it happens. So, that's pretty salacious. That leaves us wanting to find out more. So, thank you very much, Amaru. Yeah, those two cases or suggestions were found on the YouTube channel. Oh, okay. Well, they're great. They're really great recommendations. I think we'll do both of them. And then Cindy wrote in with a case that has been recommended before that we're definitely covering. I've already made that decision. So do you want to read that one or do you want me to do that one? You can do it. Okay, so a suggestion from Cindy, friend of the show, who sends us case suggestions at least once a week, and we really appreciate it. So Cindy writes, Please have, on the regular podcast as opposed to the subscription one, this case, Chandler Halderson, living a double life, a 23-year-old male, making his family think he was going to college, when in reality he failed college and was all day on his computer in his bedroom playing video games. This took place in Wisconsin. I forget which city. So we haven't done a lot of Wisconsin cases either. This should be fun for finding a beer. So I think this is a fairly well-known case, but I'll give just a quick overview. In early 2021, so not that long ago, Wisconsin man Chandler Chaz Halderson seemed to be an impressive guy. He told family members that he was a college student about to graduate. He worked at an insurance company. He helped police as a scuba diver for a rescue team. And he just got hired to work for SpaceX. So sounds great, right? Boy, I want my daughter to date him. Got his whole life ahead of him. Looking good. But unfortunately, Dickie, it all turned out to be an elaborate web of lies. This all fell apart after the defendant's father... Bart Halderson, age 50, found out that Chaz was not even going to school. Then Chaz shot his dad in the back, murdered his mother, Krista Halderson, 53, when she returned home, and threw their dismembered body parts away throughout southern Wisconsin. Then he reported them missing, telling a story about them going hours up north to their cabin. So, I've actually watched some of this trial, and it's a horrendous case, besides the fact that you have this young man killing his parents, who are by all accounts loving, caring parents. But the way he does it and the way he gets rid of the body parts, it's truly shocking. I can't believe anyone really did it. It's like a horror film. And I think if we thought ahead, we could have done this case for Halloween because it's it's really dreadful. So thank you, Cindy. You come up with some great recommendations and we will definitely be covering that one. So a quick reminder before we say goodbye, I want to remind you of our premium option of TCB, which gives you early, ad-free, and bonus episodes. We do cover a bonus case each month, sometimes two, and we send our new subscribers a gift with a personalized thank you note. So if you want to get your TCB episodes without ads, get them a day early, and get bonus episodes, you can subscribe right now by going to tiegrabber.com slash subscribe. Other ways to help out the show are to give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. We're just under a thousand reviews, so I'd love to get a handful more. If any of you have the time or the inclination to do that, it's very much appreciated. Also, we love to get emails and voicemails with your feedback and your case suggestions, so please send those in. You can send an email to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com. Voicemails can be sent by clicking on the voicemail link in our show notes of the podcast or on our website. We really love feedback, don't we, Dickie? We certainly do. One of my favorite things, and I think we got some good ones today. So thank you, guys. And thank you, most of all, everyone for listening to us. We appreciate it very much, and we'll see you next time at the quiet end. 
Come on down. We've got some seats for you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.